thank you very much for the kind invitation. And um, I don't need to apologize for the oxymoron, which is uh, the kind of moniker by which we become known. So I won't be discussing things like, why do the constants take the values they do, blah, blah, blah. I'll be discussing, I'll be questioning their constancy. And it's really quite a different issue, quite a different perspective. This is a very mixed audience, so this will be a very mixed talk. And some of it will be really for philosophers, some for observers, some for physicists, a few theoreticians. So I hope it will please everyone, some bit of it, or at least not displease everyone too much, some bits of it. I want to start actually with a very philosophical discussion. Uh, not that I thought deeply about this. this. I know this goes back to a tension between Poincaré and Mach, but more to the point, this is a tension which appears with us, with us physicists all the time, when we discuss varying constants. The constants naturally appear when you formulate the laws of physics. So the very, very big question really that appears here is what is the operational meaning of physical laws? And you have to address this issue before you actually discuss what is a varying constant, what is a constant constant, and so on. So I became a theorist for a number of reasons. I couldn't stand experimental physics, I have to admit this. And the main reason is I, I broke every piece of equipment I touched, and it's probably a, a common feature of many people who become theorists. Um, the other one is I felt really dissatisfied, or um, with, I found it very unsatisfactory, this, the way measurement is made. I was always presented with this black box, which you then went and tested physics with it. And of course, you were using physics to build this black box with which you measure these things, which you then test it. I mean, if you open the thing up, it was clear that there's, the, you saw, there's all kinds of circuitry, electronics, things which use very high level physics, and then you were told to go off and actually test foundational matters, foundational laws, when the physics inside the instrument could not possibly be the independent of the things you were testing. So I found this really unsatisfactory, and this is one of the reasons why I, this is, I hated experimental physics, of course. Experimentalists are more worried about noise, about systematics, I appreciate that I was being a bit naive, but from a conceptual point of view, there is something quite disturbing there, which is there seems to be tautologies all over the place when you make measurements. So one view about this is that, well, uh, that is maybe true, but we do put satellites in space and they kind of don't fall. We have mobile phones, they kind of sort of work, sometimes anyway. So there is at least consistency and you might have this attitude that Physics is at most consistent rather than provable. I also find this very unsatisfactory. I'll give you examples of why this is the case. Because quite often what happens is that the, that may be true, but there could be more than one way of phrasing things which is consistent. And why do you pick that particular one? So it's not just a matter of consistency. There has to be some kind of other principle which decides why we frame the laws the way we do. And the heart of the matter, if you think a bit about it, and I'll be more concrete in the next slide, is really this issue, how do we define our units? What is assumed to be constant? What is assumed to be variable? So let me give you one example, just to put this in focus. I will be giving you rather complex examples of varying constant theories later on. But this is a nice test tube to illustrate these issues. And let's look at Newton's gravitational law as you, say, as you know, it states the force acting on two bodies is proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance. Well, proportional means there must be a proportionality constant. Constant, there's a constant of nature. And this is how constants come into physics. You're formulating laws, but they appear naturally. Now, the implication of Newton's gravitational law is that the acceleration of gravity doesn't depend on the test body. But then does change, right? It implies that it depends on the mass of the source. And as you go up, as you, in height, as you go away from the source, this acceleration changes. So in a way, what you're doing here is saying that, well, there is this little g, which is varying, and the constant is the gravitational constant, g, capital G. Now, you may not know this, but Galileo thought that actually the acceleration of gravity was a constant. So the little g, according to Galileo, was a constant, not the big G. <coughs> and this is interesting to illustrate the point that what is considered to be constant or variable depends on the given historical moment you're at, depends on the phenomenology which you have available to you. And it's interesting that here, you basically, the, the jump from Galileo to Newton consisted of 
essentially shifting the constancy of little g to capital G. And of course, Newton's law is a lot more complex. It's a lot more complicated to say that little g is variable when it's constant. It's more complex, but it also explains a lot more phenomenology, for example, Kepler's laws. And there's a bunch of reasons why this was done, and it's interesting why one thing led to a constant being promoted to a variable. <coughs> now, this is a great test tube for addressing the issues I will be facing later on. And some of these philosophical issues have been creeping into the physics, uh, well, literature quite a bit. So I decided to spend some time on it. Both statements, little g constant, little g variable, have units, the dimension full. I'm not talking about a dimension less quantity being variable. I'm talking about a dimension full quantity with units of acceleration being variable or being a constant. And there is this myth in the community that only dimensionless quantities can be variable or constant. There's no sense about dimension full things varying. And this is not true because, of course, so the, the kind of cliche people come, come up with is that, well, if a dimension full constant is seen to vary, I could always redefine the unit so that this guy is constant, so that doesn't mean anything. Well, that is true, but of course, even in the Newtonian picture, I could always redefine the units of time, for example, so that the g, the little g, would be a constant. In fact, it's very simple. Suppose I insisted on measuring time with a pendulum clock on the moon, on a space station, wherever I went. I said my unit of time is not something which comes from electromagnetic processes or a spring or the way I age, because I age electromagnetically, but it's something which is connected to the pendulum to going around in the air. So if you think about redefining all the Newtonian physics in terms of these particular unit of time, you've done just that. You've redefined the unit so that little g is a constant in Newtonian theory. So of course you can do that, but exercise for the student, go and do it. It's a mess, okay? What looks very simple in the Newtonian picture looks abso an absolute mess if you do this exercise. And of course you still obtain a consistent picture, which is why I said consistency is not the only factor. You have two pictures here, both equally consistent, but you pick one, and the reason why you pick one is simplicity. So I don't think, I mean, there are tautologies, there are definitions in the particular way you define a given theory, but they're always somehow informed by simplicity, and there's a very good reason why you do that. Conclusion. Well, it's a myth that you can only talk about varying dimensionless constants. You talk all the time about very dimensionful constants. I gave you the example of little g. Another example, the universe is expanding. That's also a dimensionful statement. Okay? It's not really true that you can always change the units to random them constant. Of course you can, but you make a mess. Is the universe not expanding? Well, I could immediately change the units and say the universe is not expanding. Then the atoms will be shrinking. The Einstein equations will not be valid. Atomic physics would have to be different. So there's a good reason why we choose a particular description, which is dimension full, and that's called simplicity. You don't want to make a mess of it. So I hope this is clear. The reason is, um, well, I hear you've talked a lot about the values of the constants, and I think this is important. There's a very big difference between a perspective in which a dimensionless constant doesn't change and in which a, in which a dimensionless constant is seen to change, whether or not that's something we observe or not. The perspective is really completely different. So clearly, the reason why people say you should only look at dimensionless quantities is if this is a constant, well, clearly it's stupid to say these guys are varying, okay? That's the first thing. But then second, if I want to explain why 137, then it doesn't make any sense to say why E equals whatever, because that depends on the unit. So if actually things, if the constants are constant indeed, and you want to explain their value, you should look at dimensionless quantities, because they're the only ones which have a numerical meaningful value. Okay, that is completely clear. And I think the confusion came because if you now see these guys varying on the other end, the perspective is completely different. The value of one, 137 doesn't mean anything because it's going to be varying. It's going to be 138 in a few billion years. Okay. So if a dimensionless constant varies, then we can and should question the constancy of their dimensionful uh, components. However, as the example I gave you of Newtonian gravitational law shows, you can never do that in a void. Okay. If you're going to talk about dimensionful constants varying, you have to propose a dynamics, which is not just about varying alpha, it's about varying everything. 
And it's meaningless to talk about this variability without the full dynamics. And the full dynamics will then prefer, picks up a preferred set of units where the description is simpler. And that determines finally what's varying and what's not. OK, this has caused so much confusion in the physics community and observers community. And I think it was worth mentioning. If alpha is varying, what is it varying? Is it E, C, or H bar? Again, you need to give me a theory. You need to give me the full set of dynamics. And I think this affects the observers as well. You already build instruments. This goes back to my trauma. You already have a black box measuring redshift, doing spectroscopy, doing whatever. All these various things are already assuming a whole body of physics, OK? And that will pick up a, a specific kind of units, which will then tell if it's a varying E, a varying C, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll give you examples later on. I'm going to be talking about concrete examples for the rest of the talk. Now, sociological point, this is very funny, because people always say, you cannot talk about varying C because it has units. And it, these are people who spend all their lives talking about varying G, varying E, which have units, OK? So uh, people don't even realize the contradiction there is in here. So it's only when you talk about varying C that these issues suddenly come about. And can we talk about the varying speed of light? This, yes, the same way you can talk about a varying E or a varying G. And of course, it's stupid to say the speed of light is always one light year per year, OK? That's a tautology, undoubtedly. What I'm saying is that I can come up with concrete proposals for dynamics in which setting C to 1 would be as stupid as using a pendulum clock to describe Newton's laws. That's basically all I'm saying, and I will give you concrete examples. OK, let me move on to an historical intermezzo before I start in, in earnest. So the, the shift is really quite significant, and the reason was the following. I mean, if you really think the constants are constant, 137, why 137? Okay? And I think historically, at some point, people try to explain these with numerology. And the reason is we know why pi is what it is. There's a, an expansion that gives it, or the little e, we know all that. So it would be nice to explain why alpha is what it is using the constants of mathematics. And I believe Heisenberg was the first one to notice this, that the value of alpha is approximately pi divided by you know, this combination of numbers. Of course, measurements of alpha improved. So then he proposed this, at which point People thought, well, this has the hallmark of a bad idea completely. Okay. And I think the idea is that the perspective is really quite different if you think that maybe the solution to all this is that these constants are not constant at all. And then there's nothing to explain. I mean, why is the, why is the brightness in this room what it is? Because someone switched on the light or switched off that light or whatever. So the explanation then becomes circumstantial. There's nothing to do about 137. It's something which is really you know, part of the dynamics and the evolution and the history of the universe. So this is quite interesting, you, know, you probably know this story. Wolfgang Pauli was an example of someone. Was totally obsessed with the number 137. To the point that when he was taken to hospital with his terminal disease to die, he insisted on being put on room number 137. <laughs> I wouldn't go anywhere else. Well, of course, from the perspective of varying constants, wait 10 billion years and you'll be asking for room 138. So there's nothing fundamental about it. And we're in Cambridge. This was the man, actually, who came up with this shift in perspective, Paul Dirac. I always present these, those who've seen me, I always present this quote, which I love. One field of work in which there has been too much speculation is cosmology. Its models are probably all wrong. It is usually assumed that the laws of nature have always been the same as they are now. There is no justification for this. In particular, quantities which are considered to be constants of nature may be varying with cosmological time. So very interesting, very deep. He's actually questioning, I won't have time to go into that. So also a very philosophical thing. Could it be that the laws of physics, not just the constants, the laws of physics are changing in time? It would open all kind of worms if you get there. And I, I think I won't have time to get into that. So not widely known, but um, this paper was written when Dirac was on a honeymoon. Not on record what uh, his wife thought about all this. What is on record is what Niels Bohr thought about these. Look what happens to people when they get married. <laughs> Niels Bohr, of course, was married and had five kids, so he should know. OK, let me move on into concrete things. I said this is going to be a very mixed talk. And because it is a very mixed audience, let me go into more mathematical things at different levels. I mean, obviously, the constants are not all the same. So you can play this game 
but be careful with what constants you target. Some constants like H bar C and Boltzmann constant are very structural. So I will give you examples where they vary, but be careful because you bound, you don't have to, but if you're not careful, you're bound to cause a lot of damage to the, the, the framework of physics. Other constants like G and E are really interaction strengths. And what you're talking about is the variability of these strengths. And Brent's Dicke theory is a prototype of that. And then there's a bunch of things called this, what I call descriptive constants. And as you know, the standard model has no shortage of them. In fact, the problem is it has too many of them for comfort. And all of these things have been targeted one way or another for variability. I'm going to give you some examples of how this is done. So foremost, this is the, the theory, the prototype theory, Brent's Dicke theory of varying gravitational constants. This can be introduced in many different ways. You know, Pedro already talked about this yesterday. I'll be giving you a more mathematical way to introduce it in 10 minutes or so. The very simple way to introduce it is just uh, use these three principles. So principle of correspondence, I want to have a theory in which G varies, but if I force G to be a constant, I want to recover all the known physics, which I have when G is a constant. So this is a sensible thing to do. Minimal coupling, I want to modify my laws of physics minimally when I allow this G to be a variable. What kind of variable? Well, this is the third principle is really just, a, it's not really necessary, but the simple thing, simplest thing is to make G a scalar field. And then you can do all kinds of more complicated things if you want. But all these amounts too is actually you get an action, for example, you promote your G to a scalar field and you just replace, every time you see a G, you replace the appropriate function of your scalar field. This should not be tried at home by non-experts, okay? And I'll tell you why. This, is, this looks very simple. Oh, I just go there. Every time I see a G, I put a 1 over a, a 5. No, 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 no. Because the problem is the laws of physics actually appear in three levels. There's typically an action principle, field equations, and then integrability conditions. And so, for example, with the Einstein-Hilbert action, we have the, Einstein, the action, then you have the Einstein equations, and then you have the Bianchi identities, which are integrability conditions and give you conservation of the stress-energy tensor. Going between these three different levels, you have derivatives, okay? So if G is a constant, that doesn't matter, but if it varies, you, you basically generate gradients of G when you do that. So you have to decide on which level you're going to play this game, because depending on which you play this game, you end up with different phenomenologies. So be very careful. The, cl the classic example is to play this game with the Einstein equations, then you break the Bianchi identities, you force stress energy not to be conserved, etc., etc. You violate the equivalence principle, then all the experimentalists start shouting at you, and it's all kinds of unpleasant things happen anyway. So the reason why Brands Dicke theory is so well defined is that you actually do this in the right place minimally, and it's all very nice, very conservative, very beautiful theory. The only thing you need to do, as you know, you have to add dynamics for phi. This is a typical example of what you do. We end up with a wave equation for your field phi. So if you have variations in time, you must have variations in space as well. This was already mentioned. So variations in time and in space have to come as a package in these theories. What drives variations is the, tr the trace of the stress energy tensor, which means radiation is zero. That. So in radiation epoch, you don't expect variations. In G, matter epoch, you expect variations. So it's the kind of profile you find in these theories. So physical content, well, this was done carefully so that the equivalence principle is preserved, very important. But then you realize that other predictions from G are modified. And typically, for example, the precession of the perihelion of Mercury is different. The radar echo delay is different, etc. Having shouted at Pedro yesterday for not, for not saying this is symmetric, I actually made the same mistake. This is the bound we have these days, okay? So when you always end up with a bound on a parameter because you have new phenomenology, in this case, when W goes to infinity, you recover general relativity and constant G. Well, the, this guy must be bigger than this, okay? And you preserve the Pisa Tower experiment by construction. Okay, here's one example. We'll be revisiting it in a minute for reasons which will be obvious later on. Varying electric charge theories is clearly are the simplest things you can do if you want to explain varying alpha. So you can play the same game, yet again, if you're not professional, don't try this at home. There are pitfalls everywhere, and you have to be careful about this. 
So you could go to the action, do the same thing. There's a gauge derivative here, there's an E. So the temptation is simply, well, let's just make that a variable. So very often, this is the point, E may be implicit. So this thing of uh, wherever I find an E, I put a field or a function of a given field. Be careful because actually there's an implicit E in the gauge transformations. So they're not in the action, but implicitly the gauge transformations contain the E. And therefore, if you don't want to break gauge invariance, you can break gauge invariance if you want, okay? But if you don't want to break gauge invariance, you actually have to do this change, which is non-minimal. So this is an example of a pitfall. We have to take care when you play this game. It's this, the principles are the same, but of course there's always a small print somewhere. And a small print is be very careful. And it be careful in this case means be careful with gauge invariance. Okay, you do this, what happens? You still need to add the dynamics for phi. It's the same story. You end up with a wave equation, this case driven by E squared minus B squared. So for that is zero for radiation. Yet again, we have these profiles. You would not expect the electric charge to change in the radiation epoch. You hit the matter epoch and you start driving changes. Typical profile. So what's the problem with this theory? Well, I preserve gauge invariance, but now be very careful because now this field will couple differently to different types of matter because it couples to E square minus B square. Now the neutron has and the proton have different amounts of E square minus B square, specifically E square. So different types of matter with different neutron proton contents will couple to this guy differently and therefore there will be a fifth force which violates the Pisa Tower experiment. So this theory is really on the border of being killed all the time because of this. It's very, very constraining um, if you violate the equivalence principle, and this is the case in this theory. Okay, next level, and this is the first example of a varying C theory. You could play exactly the same game. These theories are not very useful, okay? It's the most conservative thing I can do, having a varying C. It's completely useless for cosmology, but it's just to show that this can be done exactly in analogy with what I've done before. I could go to my action and change. Every time I have a C, I do a change, just like before. Except the C appears in many more places now, and in many more different roles. And in fact, the pitfalls are even bigger. If I, so I have the same issues, the, the covariant derivatives of the various gauge interactions of C, and if I don't want to break edge invariance, I have to redefine things very carefully, just like I did with the varying theory. In addition, if I don't want to break, in this case, the decision is clearly from the start, I don't want to break Lorentz invariance. So you have to be very careful, local Lorentz invariance and covariance, so that they're not breaking, we have to use this quantity x0 rather than t, otherwise you have a preferred frame, you cause a mess. We've done that too, but you know, that's a choice you have. You don't have to choose to go completely crazy. So you end up with more options. You basically have more parameters because now the C appears as well where G used to appear. It appears in front of the Lagrangian for matter. It appears in all the gauge derivatives. But now because of this, so these things are more complicated, this thing is actually fun in a bit because you can bypass violations of the equivalence principle here as long as you do the coupling in a way which is the same for all types of forces. So you go to the gauge derivative for SU3, SU2, U1. You make sure the C is in such a way that nothing really is going to be different for different types of interactions, different types of matter. So you end up with a the theory in which the alpha electromagnetic, the, the alpha weak, the alpha strong, all have to change with the same proportion because they're all basically coupled to C in the same way. And the result is obviously a theory in which I chose not to break Lorentz invariance, I chose not to break age invariance, and as a result, the equivalence principle is preserved, the strength of all interactions is forced to vary with a well-defined scaling law. So, very, very conservative theory, completely useless, okay? If I try to do cosmology with this, this doesn't go very far. Fortunately, because C is so ubiquitous, I have a whole range of crazier things I can do, and I'm forced to do them if I really want to do cosmology. So here's a list of things. I'll mention two foremost. So this is what I just mentioned. These theories have variations of C in space and time. I can have bimetric theories. This is a completely crazy theory, don't worry about that. So this one here is, you can have variations of C with the energy. So you can have a situation in which the colors of the rainbow go at different speeds, slightly. In fact, you would need to go to the Planck frequency to, for this to go up to infinity, but there's always a small effect. These are theories with the form dispersion relations, and they're very interesting. 
So let me mention these two theories, and with regards to a very important point, okay, which is what I really want to do is cosmology, and this is the big conundrum. Now, the conundrum is a very weird thing, and I'm going to popular science, okay, what do you do when you're giving a talk to the general public? Here's the universe, picture of the universe, okay? This is actually basically homogeneous. What you see is an amplification to 10 to the, minus, to 10 to the 5 of these fluctuations, which are very small, okay? And then you notice that if you have a Big Bang theory, what is the causal region, the region which can have contacted, you know, causal contact since the Big Bang, assuming a standard model, it's about the size of the Moon. So you have this sky in which you see the universe when it was 380,000 years old. Moon by moon region has never seen each other. There's no contact between these regions. And of course, then you say, well, this is very strange. How did the universe become homogeneous if it wasn't in contact? Well, maybe it was homogeneous from start, OK? To my mind, the problem is the fluctuations, not the homogeneity. The homogeneity, you could always wave your hands and say, well, it's homogeneous, forget it. But these fluctuations are really, really strange. And let me explain beyond popular science now what it means, because that's really very important. So this is your horizon problem. What is the issue? The issue is this, OK? These fluctuations is actually the Planck map. They're very, very specific. And what this means is the following. If you take these fluctuations and you try to quantify in what kind of, you know, some kind of the expression is called gauge invariant. If you try to quantify what they are, this is what you do. So if the universe were completely unperturbed, what we would see in the universe is a Hubble flow. Okay, things just going around in a Hubble flow. But because of these small fluctuations, what we actually see is a disturbed Hubble flow. So if you look at galaxies and things which are going along with the cosmic expansion, they partake in a disturbed Hubble flow. So what you do to quantify these fluctuations is the following. What you do is you integrate these disturbed Hubble flow observers into orthogonal surfaces. They will be flat if the Hubble flow were undisturbed. They're not flat. So what you do is you compute the extrinsic curvature of these free surfaces. Now, then you do Fourier transform. That's what physicists do, right? First, if you don't know what to do, you do a Fourier transform, right? So you do a Fourier transform with this quantity, and you evaluate the power spectrum of this thing. But before that, you note this very interesting thing. The dimensions of this guy are L to the 3 halves. So this was before inflation. This was before Zeldovich did this, long before inflation, long before varying Cs, before varying constants, everything. You realize the following. Purely on dimensional grounds, if you compute this quantity, which is the power spectrum times k cubed, this thing does not have dimensions, because the dimensions of this guy are killed by the K, the wave mode. So this thing can at most be a dimensionless constant, A square. If you want to have a K dependence on the other side to balance the dimensions, you must have K over K preferred, preferred scale. And for historical reasons, this function is usually written as a power in which the NS could be a K function, but a slowly varying function of K. And it's obvious that if you don't want to have a preferred scale, NS must be 1. Okay? And S equals 1 means harrison zeldovich spectrum means scale invariance. And this was long before inflation, long before anything. Basically, people knew they said to be, it was a preferred, it was a sweet spot in the possible spectra that you could have. Okay, I don't know if you like Monty Python, here's the Holy Grail. What is the zeroth order Holy Grail? So we know that things are not this simple, but this is like the zero target for any theory. And S should be approximately 1. And these amplitudes should be 10 to the minus 5. So what is the horizon problem from the perspective of someone who knows some cosmology at this level, which is quite basic? The horizon problem is that if you actually have this causal structure, it can be proved n must be bigger or equal than 4. Okay, the problem is not so much how did I homogenize the universe. There's a thing called the Zeldovich bound, which tells you that if I conserve energy and momentum, and I just move things around in a classical process, and I have a causal structure like this, n could never be approximately 1 as observed. So this is the horizon problem. I mean, forget about what popular science books tell you. This is actually the problem, OK? And as you know, inflation solves the horizon problem. Because if you have accelerated expansion, there's a way to open up these horizons in the beginning. But you need very specific uh, accelerated expansion to generate a near-scale invariant spectrum. And it's the same thing with varying C theories, okay? 
It is true this idea came up in a pub you know, originally. If you want to solve the horizon problem, why don't you raise the speed limit? Varying speed of light theories, eh? It's obvious, okay? What is not obvious is that you can generate a near scale invariant spectrum and that acts as a sieve between the different kinds of theories. And this is why I'm going to tell you about more complicated varying speed of light theories. They do generate the right fluctuations. Okay, let me move on to those. And in that case, this is actually quite a different way to look at things. And I think Pedro yesterday already did this. Um, Bimetric theories. What are bimetric theories? So I pointed out there's a bunch of ideas of possibilities you can do, various things you can do with varying C. I gave you the useless version, but the very simple one to introduce. This one's covariant. Let me tell you about bimetric and the form dispersion relations, but with concrete regards to what happens in terms of producing structure. So bimetric theories are very interesting in the sense that why do I have two metrics? I end up basically with two metrics. Why do I have two metrics? I have two metrics because I like Lorentz invariance so much. I take two copies of Lorentz invariance, okay? Not one, but two, and these metrics represent it. And then I do something dynamically very meaningful, which is I use one of these metrics to produce the Einstein-Gilbert action, and I use the other to minimally couple to matter. So a very simple idea. You call the first metric the Einstein frame. You call the second metric the matter frame. And a more sophisticated way to introduce brandes dicke theory and this is not obvious, okay? So I introduced brandes dicke theory in a very nice, simple way. This is not obvious, but you can actually show that brandes dicke theory is a theory in which these two metrics are conformal. So there's just a function relating these two metrics, and this function actually renormalizes the G. So you effectively, we have a varying gravitational constant because of this. Not obvious, but it's a fact, mathematical fact. So the light cones for these two metrics are the same. Because if I multiply a metric by a, com by a function, the light cones don't change. So that's when ds squared equals zero. That's the same for one, one metric and the other. A varying speed of light is nothing but the same trick in which the two metrics are not conformal. So specifically, I could write the matter metric equals the Einstein metric plus something like these two gradients of a scalar field. So they're no longer just proportional. What this means is that I will have two light cones, one for gravitons, and one for, for light and massless particles, and they're not superposed. So if I take a frame in which the light cone for gravity is fixed, then the matter one is increasing, it's basically flattening out, or vice versa. You could actually do the, the opposite as well. <coughs> so it is clear that uh, solving the horizon problem means nothing but making the speed of light go to infinity at the Big Bang, okay? That's obvious and it's clear that you can organize your theory such that, you know, you solve the horizon problem, and then you have a huge amount of choices. What is not obvious is that you can generate scale invariant fluctuations. So this was a long calculation. We did it from different angles. It's completely watertight, and it's an interesting result. It turns out that the minimal theory, bimetrical theory, produces the zeroth order holy grail I mentioned. So specifically, so what happens is you basically, you want to have dynamics, Klein-Gordon dynamics in the matter frame for this field. You want to give this guy to be a constant. This is sufficient to generate scale invariant fluctuations. And this guy is dimension full. If this guy over the plank is tweaked, you get 10 to the minus 5. So it's a remarkable result. And this is the equivalent of the sitter in inflation. So the sitter gives you exact scale invariant. The minimal bimetric gives you exact scale invariant. And I think that's a remarkable result. Now, OK, I'm going to go a bit more for the observers who are here. So I said this is going to be a talk at many different levels. The zero for the holy grail is no longer enough. As you know, the devil is in the detail. And the detail is what Planck has revealed, what maybe Bicep has revealed, we don't know yet, okay? So the spectrum is not exactly scale invariant, it's slightly red. It's not very difficult, actually. So you can actually generate that quite easily by making this B a power law, okay? That generates a, a red spectrum, and that's not very difficult to do. One thing which is interesting is that this theory predicts zero gravitational waves, okay? And I'm saying this completely without any shame, okay? Um, I was, I think I mentioned this during, during the session, the, the questions yesterday. I was at a conference two weeks ago in which Jérôme Martin, who is one of the guys who wrote that beautiful paper on evidence for inflation, okay? He just said, this is incredible, this proves inflation, okay? Because the peak is here and, and Starobinsky R-square inflation is there. 
Therefore, this proves inflation. And at the time, I just stood up and said, look, if the, the Planck result had been there or there or anything else, there would be a model for inflation as well. Okay? So this is evidence against inflation. Because anything would have proved inflation. And therefore, if you can't disprove a theory, you cannot prove it either. It's a different perspective. I did this just to annoy people. Okay? But, but this has come to very vividly to us, very poignantly to us. Two weeks later, it appears that actually we're here right now. Okay? And of course, needless to say, a lot of people are saying this is evidence for inflation again. Now, biometric theories, if the bicep results are correct, biometric theories are dead. Full stop. Why? Because I did not solve the horizon problem for gravity. I solved it for matter. So I have scalar modes. I don't have tensor modes. The ratio between tensors and scales is zero exactly. So if the bicep results are correct, then this theory, this biometric theory, is ruled out. And I'm very happy to say this. Okay? And this is why this is better than inflation. Okay? This is dead if bicep results are. Just one more point. Um, there is predictive value, though, to the fact that by changing this B, I can actually get 0.96. So I showed you how to get scaling variance. For about a year now, we have known that to six sigma, that is to stay with us. Okay? To about six sigma, the spectrum is not one. It's going to be slightly red. So you can do that by adjusting that factor B. But you then do something very interesting. You change the three-point function. And once you go beyond the zero of order, all the is gravity waves and non-Gaussianities, which are the main target. OK, the three-point function is this rather complicated thing. I won't get into details. But if you're an expert, you'll have recognized this. The particular value, when k1 equals k2 equals k3, produces the FNL. So already the FNL of varying speed of light biometric theories is quite different okay? and from inflation. What I think is interesting is that there is a very clear prediction you make here, which is if you do adjust that B to make the spectral index not 1, you change the shape of the three-point function. So the three-point function depends on the triangles of your case. If N is 1 in your minimal theory, we have this thing called equilateral shape. If you make it 0.96, you distort this shape. And this is predictive. This is another way in which you can shoot this theory. So there's two predictions. One is this one, and you'd have to go into the three-point function to measure it. The other one is the gravity waves. We don't have to do this exercise. If bicep is right, it's great, because you don't have to do this exercise, which is actually quite difficult to do. Okay? My guess, I don't want to hazard a guess, my guess is that there are, no, there are no gravity waves, and we will have, unfortunately, we'll have to do this exercise to know whether this is right or wrong. OK, one last thing. I'm going to say this just because, of course, in this model, I think this is a class of models. This is a completely different class of models. To say that something is a varying speed of light theory is like to say that an animal is not a dog. Okay? So it's, there's a bunch of ideas, and they're really qualitatively quite different. The form dispersion relations have been around for a long time in the context of quantum gravity. And I don't want to get into the details, but essentially what you do is you, you change the relation between the energy and the momentum. So in other words, you change the relation between the frequency and the wave vector. And as you know, d omega by dk is the group speed of a, of a, thing, of a wave. So we have a varying speed of light if we have the form dispersion relations. Now, this is very interesting. This has been known for a long time. And we've been discussing this for a long time. Effectively, if you have something like this, for example, it, you would have at low energies, so when the k is very small, omega equals k. So the speed of light is 1. Okay. But as you go into higher and higher frequencies or higher and higher wave modes, you'd have omega equals k to 1 plus 2 omega, 1, one, one plus gamma, sorry. So you can see this here. And I'm just pointing this out. This has been known for a while in the context of quantum gravity. You can do cosmology with this, because you do have a varying speed of light in cosmology by proxy because of expansion. So these things are actually the physical omega and the physical k. I didn't mention this, but be very careful. Cosmologists invariably work with commoving k's. Commoving k's means my wavelength is fixed for a given mode. I do Fourier transform in commoving coordinates. I basically fix my wavelength there, and that's it. I just follow it. So there's expansion. So the physical wavelength is being, is being stretched. So the actual physical k and the physical omega are being stretched, are being changed. And of course, in time, they're changing. So what this means is, by proxy, I will have a time-varying speed of light because of expansion, because I will be scanning the whole dispersion relation. The expansion is doing the job for me. Okay? So I go to a given fixed k. Expansion is basically doing that, making the k bigger and the k smaller and smaller, the lambda bigger and bigger. 
Therefore, I will have a time varying speed of light just because the A appears here. The A is the expansion factor of the universe. Okay, this is a very simple point. It took a while for people to realize this. So we did the calculation again. Okay, what are the fluctuations that come out of this? Turns out there is something special about this particular dispersion relation. So uh, yet again, there's something funny about the minimal biometric theory. There is something funny about this particular um, dispersion relation in which the speed of light goes like p squared. You get universally, universally, you end up with the conclusion that with this you get scale invariants. And if you adjust your lambda with respect to the Planck length, you can also get into the minus 5 amplitude. <laughs> So I don't quite know what to make of this. That's basically the sitter gives you the zeroth order holy grail. If the h is appropriately chosen, it also gives you 10 to the minus 5. Minimal bimetric gives you the zeroth order holy grail. This is the zeroth order holy grail for the form dispersion relations. And if you've done anything like dimensional reduction in the UV, I know there's some quantum gravity people here, you will recognize this. This means you are dimensionally redu reducing to two dimensions in the UV. So there's something interesting about this dispersion relation. And well, let me mention what this actually implies. You can do the whole calculation beyond the zeroth order as well. It's not easy. And there are more assumptions. Here you do have a chance to actually solve the horizon problem for gravity. And you do have a chance to actually have gravity waves as well in the early universe. And the reason is what you actually have here is a very complex situation. You have basically, instead of two light cones, we have a range of light cones for different colors. Okay? So you have one light cone at low energies, and then as the frequency goes up, the light cone flattens. And more to the point, the dispersion relations could be dependent on the particle species. And specifically, they could be different for the graviton and for massless matter particles. So it's a very different theory. I personally find it very interesting. If you know about ojava lifshitz theory, it's basically this, but then for gravitons. So in fact, you can play this game. And the problem is that quantum gravity is not very predictive yet to actually pin down what are these parameters. What is this lambda? What is this gamma? But I will just stop here with one final comment, which is very interesting. So everyone has been talking about bicep, OK? If we detected gravity waves, is R.2. What does it mean in terms of this? Well, imagine that I have a dispersion relation for gravity, which is the same as the one for matter but with the parameter b here. Okay, so basically in both cases, the speed of flight and the speed of gravity go to infinity like p squared in the UV, like p cubed, sorry, in the UV. But it could be that this, this parameter which appears here is not one. So in the UV, in the ultraviolet, there is a b here, which is the ratio between the speed of gravity and the speed of light of massless uh, matter particles. So they're all diverging as I approach the Planck length but it could be that the speed of gravity is not the speed of light. It's just some fraction of it. Well, as I told you, this lambda is actually what determines the normalization of the spectrum. And specifically, when I compute this dimensionless power spectrum for scalars and tensors, if I have different, if I have a B there in the dispersion relations for the tensors, it will appear there. So it turns out if you work out all the factors, and as you know, there are a bunch of conventions which cosmologists have put in place just to annoy the students. PhD students and so on, as factors of pi which are different. If you actually work out what the R is, you end up with this 4 over B. So if I were to be a bit facetious here, I would say the bicep results imply that the speed of gravity is 20 times the speed of light in UV, which is kind of, you know, I'm joking, okay? I don't think this is going to be that simple to sort out. I think all these models will have a big um, time scale to discuss. We have not worked out, for example, non-Gaussianities for these guys. We have not worked out consistency relations. So we'll see. I'll just basically wrap up by having shown you all these experimental implications of these theories. Let me just point out that as far as I know, at least it's in John Barrow's book with Tipler on, on the entropic principle. As far as I know, the first time a varying speed of light was proposed was in 1874 by Kelvin. And of course, for him, measuring the speed of light was like measuring the speed of, of, a, of a car or whatever, of a train. There, there was nothing fundamental about the speed of light. It was another speed to go and measure. So in 1874, Kelvin actually wondered whether the speed of light was varying in time. 1905 came along, and look at what happened. Eddington in the 1930s, a variation in C is self-contradictory. This is basically like saying the speed of light is one light year per year. Okay? So this is completely 
ridiculous in the sense that, you know, there's, it's true we develop the formalism in a way which makes varying a C very awkward. But this is not about formalism, it's about experiment. And in particular, the relativity theory was proposed because of very concrete experiments. The Michelson-Morley experiment, obviously, and famously, but also the whole electromagnetic theory. Maxwell's theory basically pushes you to the theory of relativity. There's a huge amount of <coughs> framework, of experimental framework, which is behind that. So I think this issue of developing formalism in which C cannot vary is really obscuring the fact that there's a lot of experiments behind it. And this is my favorite quote from Einstein. Since mathematicians invaded relativity, I don't understand it myself anymore. <laughs> and I think that's really what has been happening. We basically have been simplifying the notation, developing formalism, which has been obscuring the fact that constancy of C or varying of C was from the start a matter of experiment, and it still is a matter of experiment. So I'll finish with Hertz's quote, another quote I like very much. What is due to experiment may always be rectified by experiment. No, stop here.